Our society, that is, we ourselves, all of us, is defining the individual with a double bind, commanding him to be free and separate from the world, which he is not, for otherwise the command would not work. Under the circumstances, it works only in the sense of implanting an illusion of separateness, just as the commands of a hypnotist can create illusions. Thus bamboozled, the individual, instead of fulfilling his unique function in the world, is exhausted and frustrated in efforts to accomplish self-contradictory goals. Because he is now so largely defined as a separate person caught up in a mindless and alien universe, his principal task is to get one up on the universe and to conquer nature. This is palpably absurd, and since the task is never achieved, the individual is taught to live and work for some future in which the impossible will at last happen, if not for him, then at least for his children. We are thus breeding a type of human being incapable of living in the present, that is, of really living. For unless one is able to live fully in the present, the future is a hoax. There is no point whatever in making plans for a future which you will never be able to enjoy. When your plans mature, you will still be living for some other future beyond. You will never, never be able to sit back with full contentment and say, Now I've arrived! Your entire education has deprived you of this capacity because it was preparing you for the future instead of showing you how to be alive now. In other words, you have been hypnotized or conditioned by an educational processing system arranged in grades or steps, supposedly leading to some ultimate success. First nursery school or kindergarten, then the grades or forms of elementary school, preparing you for the great moment of secondary school. But then more steps, up and up to the coveted goal of university. Here, if you are clever, you can stay on indefinitely by getting into graduate school and becoming a permanent student. Otherwise, you are heading step by step for the great outside world of family raising, business, and profession. Yet, graduation day is a very temporary fulfillment, for with your first sales promotion meeting, you are back in the same old system, being urged to make that quota, and if you do, they'll give you a higher quota, and so progress up the ladder to sales manager, vice president, and at last president of your own show, about 40 to 45 years old. In the meantime, the insurance and investment people have been interesting you in plans for retirement, that really ultimate goal of being able to sit back and enjoy the fruits of all your labors. But when that day comes, your anxieties and exertions will have left you with a weak heart, false teeth, prostate trouble, sexual impotence, fuzzy eyesight, and a vile digestion. All this might have been wonderful if, at every stage, you had been able to play it as a game, finding your work as fascinating as poker, chess, or fishing. But for most of us, the day is divided into work time and play time, the work consisting largely of tasks which others pay us to do because they are abysmally uninteresting. We therefore work, not for the work's sake, but for money, and money is supposed to get us what we really want in our hours of leisure and play. In the United States, even poor people have lots of money compared with the wretched and skinny millions of India, Africa, and China, while our middle and upper classes, or should we say income groups, are as preposterous as princes. Yet, by and large, they have but slight taste for pleasure. Money alone cannot buy pleasure, though it can help, for enjoyment is an art and a skill for which we have little talent or energy. As it is, we are merely bolting our lives, gulping down undigested experience as fast as we can stuff them in, because awareness of our own existence is so superficial and so narrow that nothing seems to us more boring than simple being. If I ask you what you did, saw, heard, smelled, touched, and tasted yesterday, I am likely to get nothing more than the thin, sketchy outline of a few things that you noticed, and of those, only what you thought worth remembering. Is it surprising that an existence so experienced seems so empty and bare that its hunger for an infinite future is insatiable? But suppose you could answer, it would take me forever to tell you and I am much too interested in what's happening now. 
How is it possible that a being with such sensitive jewels as the eyes, such enchanted musical instruments as the ears, and such a fabulous arabesque of nerves as the brain can experience itself as anything less than a god? And, when you consider that this incalculably subtle organism is inseparable from the still more marvelous patterns of its environment, from the minutest electrical designs to the whole company of galaxies, how is it conceivable that this incarnation of all eternity can be bored with being? <laughs>